uh, session by uh, Daisy Chung. Uh, I think Daisy should be on uh, board. Yes, I can see her. Hi, yeah. Daisy. Uh, uh, do you have access for sharing the screen? Um, Aisha, let me try right now. Yes. And... All right. Can you all see the screen? And then I'll start the slideshow. Can you see, I'll see it? Yes, perfect. Okay. One more call. Yeah. Let me uh, go ahead and introduce Daisy uh, to everybody. So Daisy is actually uh, one of the speakers that was uh, contacted because of a popular demand that SNAV members had because Daisy has also given a fantastic talk in 2021 in uh, SNAV's uh, event series. So after a popular demand, we have Daisy back with us for uh, our virtual conference. So, uh, Daisy is an award-winning uh, science uh, visual communicator and illustrator, and she's actually originally from Taiwan and New Zealand. Uh, she currently works as a graphics journalist at uh, Rogers Graphic Graphics, creating original interactive graphic projects and uh, infographic designs uh, with the focus on environmental and uh, biological topics. Previously, she has also worked uh, as a data visual designer at uh, Sergo Ventures and as a graphics editor at uh, National Geographic magazine. Uh, where she worked with uh, a very collaborative team to engage uh, the public through the powerful uh, visual and data storytelling capabilities. Daisy aims to make science more accessible, which is really the need of the R, and she works directly with experts to communicate uh, their research for to the broader audience. Uh, you can see her work featured uh, in the Scientific American, uh, National Geographic, Cell Press, uh, the Journal of Neuroscience, and various other uh, science and educational platforms. Uh, and uh, when Daisy is not drawing, uh, Daisy enjoys a good hike, uh, climbing the rocks. And uh, the, my favorite one is uh, she finds different ways of using uh, the sourdough starter. So. I think your apartment or home might smell really good because of the sourdough bread. So Daisy, the screen is yours. Again, thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Oh yeah, um, thank you so much um, for having me and for Shepra for this very warm introduction. Um, my name is Daisy and I'm right now currently based in Sunnyvale, California. I'm a science visual communicator and designer and like mentioned, I was originally from Taiwan and spent my childhood in New Zealand, so that's where I learned English and apologies in advance for a very confusing accent you'll hear, but I am taking my oath right after this to become a US citizen, so hopefully I'll gradually become <laughs> more fluent and that's why I do have a hard stop for this talk, apologies in advance. Um, but feel free to contact me afterwards if you have more follow up questions. And like mentioned, I currently work as a graphics journalist at Raiders Graphics, creating illustrations and information graphics with a focus on environmental and biological topics. But I do have to confess, though I do have a background in biology, um, I don't really have expertise in the EV field. So when first approached by Shipra and Snoff, I thought, an EV electrical vehicle company invited me to talk and I was really confused. Um, however, I do have a lot of experience using visuals and storytelling and art to communicate complex information, such as the really ma many amazing research you all do in the EV field. So hopefully in the end, it will still be relevant to you all when you guys have to think about ways to share your work to a broader audience. And yeah, so to start off, I've been doing visual communication for the past 10 years in my work here, like spends for more illustrative infographics for magazines like the Rainforest poster I did for Nat Geo and the visual explainer for Parasite Cycles, as well as cover illustrations. 
And then in more recent years, as our main communication platform has shifted from print to digital, my project has also shifted to digital. So here are two of my projects that I recently created for Raiders, and both are about plant conservation, which I'll dive in deeper a little bit later. And most recently, as a Taiwanese, I did start a passion project with a collaborator and a fellow Taiwanese data viz developer, Julia Janiki, to initiate a Taiwan data stories project, which is essentially a series of visual stories all about Taiwan, from boba tea to mango diversity to Lunar New Year foods. But that's a little bit off topic today, so if you're interested, you can search Taiwan data stories, follow us, or ask me if you want to learn more. Uh, for today's talk, though, I will focus more on science visuals and walk through my process in creating information graphics, both for print and digital, and some lessons I learned in communicating science through art. But before we jump in, I want to talk about what exactly is information graphics, because there's so many different definitions out there. But quoting from my Scientific American mentor and senior graphics editor, Jen Christensen, they're essentially images built on a foundation of research that are constructed primarily to convey information. So for example, this graph that I worked on about new research showing spiders flying using electromagnetic forces, the information graphic distilled primary research material you see on the left to convey the more crucial parts as a visual explainer on the right to our targeted readers. And then it can be thought of as a continuum with more figurative representation at one end and more abstract representation like data viz on the other end. But most often than not, it really combines a full spectrum to tell a compelling story while still having visual hierarchy, such as this really beautiful graphic Manuel Canales did at Nat Geo. It's about kind of how the space race to moon is developing. And to create a successful, engaging graphic, here is kind of a rough creative process I usually follow, which is really inspired by Alberto Cario's book, The Functional Art, and Jen's book, Building Science Graphics, of which I really recommend um, you all to read. And usually the first start of a project always starts with what's your point of the graphic? What should a reader really care about your focus? To have a really clear idea, of how the graphic story will be useful to your reader and what they will be able to accomplish with it is really fundamental. And then you start gathering as much information as possible to support your point, because only by knowing the full picture um, of what is already covered and what is not can you really distill the most essential and timely information for your audience. And then next is really to choose the best graphic form to emphasize your point, whether it's a chart or map or diagram or illustrations. How do you shape your um, information to fit the goal step in step one? And then lastly is kind of thinking about style. What does it actually look like? This is a really important step and often what an audience will see. So a lot of people start in infographic design making the mistake of starting at step four. But this is really a big mistake because before you think about your style and what it looks like, you must really think about your structure and your goal. So kind of what all this means in practice, I will show some of the examples and how I use this process throughout my projects. For example, this graphic is about how we use nanotubes to rewire the heart. I started off with really loose sketch and just information blocks to really nail down the structure first before polishing to the very final style. And another example that I did is about a graphic about why animals are black and white for National Geographic, where I started off actually creating the structure with more realistic sketches. But at the final stage, I chose a more striking contrast and style to really drive the idea of black and white for our readers. And then I also often help scientists submit cover designs for their papers, which I think perhaps some of you have experienced in, and I thought I would dive deeper following the creative process of making one of my favorite cover project shown on the right. It's kind of true that when you submit a cover image, you never really know if you'll get picked. 
But still, I argue there is value in creating great visuals for research, as it can be a really great asset used in other ways to help academic and niche science discoveries to reach a lot more people. So for this project, the scientist um, submitted a paper on single cell metabolic profiling and wanted me to show the metabolic pathways in a single cell using machinery symbologies inspired by Fritz Kahn's Men as Industrial Palace drawing shown here. And that was the request letter um, that I got from the scientist. So first we need to establish what's the point. For cover images, the point really is not to explain the science in detail like the previous explainers that I show. Rather, we want to kind of design something appealing that can be a visual hook to invite the audience to read or to buy the magazine. As you can see in these covers, we want to show something delightful and intriguing to emotionally connect with the potential audience that we have. But even though I don't really need to explain the detailed science, it doesn't mean that I don't need to fully understand the topic I'm illustrating. So I still studied really hard on his paper and dug out my old Conval textbook to study the glycosis pathways in detail. And all this gathering of all the information is to try to figure out how do we emphasize our point, which is to really get the readers hooked in the science behind this um, paper. The scientist already actually gave me a lot of great ideas seen in his sketch on the left using various metaphors. He wants to use like single uh, signal towers throughout as the tagging antibodies and various convey belts and wheels to show what happens when a glucose enter the cell. And that really got me thinking of adding more Easter eggs to add, such as making the citric acid cycle as like an orange juicer or having like the transport go through, kind of like white water rafting. And this is my first sketch that I sent to the scientists, detailing all the science behind every little visual metaphor. And that really explains why the research part is still so important to inspire all these tiny details. And then finally is when you can start thinking about the style and color. I wanted to incorporate little people working in the cell, but also not too cartoony. So I was really inspired by the style of Alexandra Bowman here. And also I want the overall color and the look to really nod to the original source of Khan's work with the vintage yellow background and dark blue showing the content. I also saw a game called Homo Machina inspired by Khan as well and really loved the vibrant color, the shading and the texture. So after putting all this together into my final rendering, ta-da, it turned out like this. And you can kind of follow the journey of the glucose entering the cell, encountering all the enzymes before entering the mitochondria. And either it does have oxygen or without oxygen, it may start making alcohol so little people are celebrating, or it will go through the citrus cycle juicer over here or it can be making lactic acid like the cheese factory. And then when it goes through the acid cycle, it will go through these rafters that are carrying electrons and it passes through the water wheels. And there's four because there's four protein complexes. And at the end, it will go through the ATV synthase that charges the ADP batteries into ATP batteries. So. All of the research did pay off, even though it looks very whimsical and pretty fun. And we hope that would kind of entice people to read on. Yeah. OK, so the next project I'm sharing is a digital project that I mentioned in the introduction about plant conservation, which uses these botanical illustrations on the left to create the interactive on the right. And as I mentioned earlier, as we go through a digital transformation, many of these print media are evolving and experimenting on how to communicate information visually using the web. And the new media does present new challenges, but it's also a very exciting opportunity because we kind of have like this endless canvas and various creative interactivity that can be created. So exactly how did I transform these illustrations on paper to a digital first story? Um, let me dive in and show you the story first. So we'll go to the web page. Let me see. 
that goes through. Yeah, and this is the page. So I'll try my best to narrate through this story so you guys don't have to read the text. But it all starts once upon a time. There was a drone expert called Ben, and he was flying his drone around the cliff of Kauai, Hawaii. And all of a sudden, whoa! He saw this really strange plant called Wilkesii hobdii. This plant is a member of the sunflower, and there used to be a ton of them. But since the Europeans came with ghosts, they kind of grazed these plants to near extinction. And in the past, researchers actually have to rope repel down to find these rare plants, which is really dangerous, and it's also limited by the length of the rope, so they often miss plants. And recently, with the new drone technology, this really changed. So since 2016, Ben started experimenting using drones to survey these plants, and it was super successful. In the case of Wilkesii hobdii, they originally thought there were only 600 plants in the wild, but with the drone, this is one image shown with one survey. There are already hundreds of them that they found on the cliff. And just within from now to from then to now, they've already found 5,500 new individuals over the couple of months. And this is super exciting for them for this very rare special plant. But exactly how do they locate these plants with drones? So first, you still have to reach the location either through tedious hikes or a helicopter. And then you have to try to find where the target is, either by spotting scope or by models. And after knowing where the plants are in the cliff, Ben will take flight this drone over to the ideal habitat and take about 40 to 50 photos every 20 minutes. And after um, taking these photos, finally Ben will bring these photos back to the lab to identify rear plants. Yeah. So where exactly are these plants? Let's kind of take a look. This is where the cliffs are and where these plants live. And these are the 11 plants that are all rare natives and are critically endangered right now. This was the number that they discovered before introducing the drone technology. And ever since the drone program started, these are the numbers that have increased significantly for all of these rare plants. And here we introduce each plant one by one. They're all super cute, but for time's sakes, I'll kind of go through fast. These little plants are really hard to see before. New to the island, beautiful hibiscus delphus plants. And then they also discover some new species during these program, which is very exciting. However, locating these plants is kind of half of the battle. It's even more important to be able to collect them. So you're able to bring these plants back to the greenhouse and potentially return them to the wild. So in 2020, Ben collaborated with Canadian researchers from Outreach Robotic, where they added a robotic arm to the drone to collect it, which is pretty cool. They call this invention Mamba. And with the robotic arm, it's dangling on the drone, essentially to help separate these two systems. So when the drone approached the cliff, it wouldn't um, jam and hit the cliff and damage the um, device, essentially. So with the help of the pilot, the Mamba will navigate to the target and then approach the sample and it can swing as far as four meters, which is pretty crazy. And they'll precisely clap the essential part of the plant, which is usually the fruiting body or flower. This is really important or else they wouldn't be able to collect seeds. And then it'll go back to the scientists, which are all super happy waiting along the cliff edges. And that really completes the full circle. So Mamba so far has collected 12 endangered species and the scientists are still like trying to develop this technology and they're obviously super happy. So this is the end of the digital story. And here are some more stories that is developed by my team that you can explore. All right, let's jump back in. Yeah. So how did I really get the idea of the story and what was the process? So first of all, our team initially wanted to do a story about conservation, but realized most of the stories are about animals. No one really cared about plants, but how do we actually find a really good story angle? 
that was when I thought about the environmental journalism program that I took part in Kauai, Hawaii in 2019, where I met the researcher Ben and in his drone program at the National Tropical Botanical Garden. And then actually two years ago, Ben approached me about new data and success and wanted to find ways to visualize this data using drones to survey plants. I was also really fortunate to be part of the Garden Flora Legion project, where I joined a group of talented artists every year just to draw plants. So I suggested to my editor at Reuters, perhaps we can do a plant story using the drone technology as an intriguing angle and use my illustration trip to do some ground reporting. After my editor agreed, the next step is to gather as much information. And that is why my title as a graphic journalist is I actually really need to do a lot of reporting work from interviewing experts to following experts off the cliffs and to learn how to use drones. Pretty cool here. And one really interesting thing was we use these AR glasses so I can actually see what the drone sees when it approaches the cliffs and all those plants close up. And another plant expert, Kim, as you can see in the red hat, also came along too to help us identify plants on the go. And then Ken is actually the guy that developed the road repel technique back in the 80s. Here's a photo of him back then doing field work. And since I really love rock climbing, I took the opportunity to learn the ropes as well. I then also joined Ben in his lab to learn how he uses predictive models to find where to search for native plants and how he used Adobe Lightroom and face tagging actually to tag new plants that he found. It's pretty cool. And then the research stage is also required to read a lot of papers to understand how the mamba works and studying the botanical herbariums and papers, since most of these plants I need to draw only exist in the wild and I can't study live samples. And then after all of the research is to kind of figure out what is the part that we want to emphasize and how do we find that visual hook. We decided for this story we want to follow one plant to show how it benefits from the technology as a more focused story for our readers. But which plant should we pick? So after um, studying all the plants, I decided on the charismatic Wilksii hobdii plants and mainly for three reasons. One is because during my first visit in the island, I encountered Hobdi's close brother with the expert Ken in the canyon seen here. And I was able to see the flower, which is actually very rare because these plants only flower once in their lifetime. And the difference of this one shown here with the Wilksii Hobdi shown on the right that we illustrated is that the Wilksii Genoxvian that I encountered had only one head spike and the one we illustrated had multiple heads on the cliff and is the one that is more rare and benefited from this technology. The second reason it's a bit more selfish is because these plants are in the Aceraceae family, which is a daisy and I'm a daisy, so I feel like I'm obligated to draw it. And the third actually is more important. It's all about our audience. And that is because it's a larger and more memorable plant visually with a more distinctive appearance. So it will visually allow our audience to see the interaction of the technology in the plant a lot easier. And then after divining the main characters and the point of the story, then comes sketching the layout and the experience. I actually always start with pencil, even though everything will be digital in the end, because I feel braver to test out things with pencil than being super precise and actually pretty surprisingly get it pretty accurate to the final stage. And then I would bring the sketch to digital where I use Adobe XD, which is a user experience UX UI software, and it allows me to really mock up what the audience will experience and also allows me to communicate my vision to the developer so he or she can start actually building the page with code. And since now, most readers access information from their tiny phones. So as designers nowadays, we really need to strive for a mobile first design, which is kind of a huge but fun challenge of how to really distill all the information on such a small canvas and also not compromise what you want to communicate in the whole user experience. 
And of course, it's not just mobile. There are so many different screen sizes and devices people use. So for each graphic element on the page, we need to make at least five different versions so the browser can detect what screen size and display the most optimal design. And this is called responsive design. And with all of the trouble, it all comes to really putting out audience first as the goal. And then finally, at the end, you can start drawing the final style. So for this story, we decided to use detailed botanical illustration for the seven plants we featured since you rarely get to see them and we really want the audience to know what they would look like. And then for the other information graphics, we opt for more sketchy style so it doesn't really compete with these plant illustration and still have a cohesive feeling using watercolor. And then I started drawing with my cat being, oops, I skipped ahead a really good supervisor, <laughs> making sure I'm on task. And then for the other infographics, I start with a watercolor wash first and then overlay the sketch digitally. And then we altered colors during the transition for the interactive. And during the final month was continuous testing with the developer to make sure all my design vision is possible through coding. And if there are any bugs, such as the plant floating out of the frame or not appearing. And most importantly, throughout the process, there are numerous critiques and review sessions to make the visual experience really good quality. This includes my colleagues at Raider Graphics team, as well as experts making sure everything is still accurate after we distill and reorganize the information. And also my family and friends, which I really value a lot since a lot of time when you dive into a project so deep, you become kind of a mini expert yourself and forget what it's like when you're new to all of this information. So by showing this in working progress to my husband or my mom or my cat or my friends, if they can't really understand, then most likely my audience won't either. So I ought to really improve what is unclear. And why I really love my job so much is that I really get to work with so many talented people from various expertise. Even though as a graphics journalist now, I have to wear many hats such as doing reporting, designer, the illustrator, but there is still a limit of what one person can do alone. For example, on this project, my graphics editor will make sure my project is in the right direction and continue to provide feedback to make it better. The developer helps to realize the design on a live page and the team often work together contributing each other's expertise. Then I would work with writers and editors, often scientists, to make sure the text and the writing and the graphics are perfectly supporting each other. And of course, the experts, both in the Garden Research Center and in the industry. You may have noticed a lot of these creative ideas from my projects often actually stem from the researcher who knows the content much better. If you recall, all of the story wouldn't really start if Ben didn't initially have the idea of visualizing his drone data. In the previous cover image project I showed, I would not have thought of combining machinery with cell metabolic pathways if it weren't for the researcher's idea. And as we move from print to digital and storytelling, it really provides a wealth of opportunities for interdisciplinary collaboration between artists, developers, writers, and researchers. And here are just some other examples of stories our team at Raiders created. You can search Raiders graphics to see other graphic projects that my talented team worked on. All right, so kind of to wrap up this talk, here are some of the take home notes that I would love you all to consider. And first is to use the power of visuals to tell stories as art is such a beautiful tool to break down complex information and emotionally connect with people. But also don't tell it alone. Work with an artist, other scientists or other creatives and see how great ideas from multiple brains can really help communicate information in a much more engaging and meaningful way. 
And finally, all of this is to foster meaningful communication and really connect with more people. As I really believe good visual storytelling can inspire action and engagement and invite more people in on learning about our really crazy and fascinating world. All right, and that's it. So thank you very much so much, Snap, for having me and happy to answer any questions and keep in touch with my email. I also will share a PDF of these slides to Snap in case people are interested and you can see more of our visual works by our team at readers.com slash graphics. So yeah, thank you so much. That's it. Thank you so much, Daisy. That was amazing. And being from New Zealand myself, um, that was really cool to hear the little New Zealand twangs. <laughs> um, so if, if anyone has questions, please put them in the chat. Um, I will kick up the questions with one of my own. So I wanted to ask what, um, how did you actually get into um, the art world? Did you um, start off with a design degree? Because um, your, your artwork is incredible. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I actually started with a biology degree. Like when I was in Taiwan, I was studying biology and went to um, freshman year of um, college studying biology. But I just like really loved art and it was really hard to study both in Taiwan. So that was a big driver for me to immigrate to the US actually to study both. And that was what I did. I double majored in biology and studio art at Rice. But at that point, I still was very fond of science. I would go to wet labs and do a lot of research work, but I just realized I wasn't really good at it. I would like get dilutions wrong and like, I'm a bad writer. I just like, don't think I can ever get grants in the future. Um, and then that was when I realized like, when I go to these conferences that um, I would follow my PI to, like all these scientists are like super excited about all these really wacky signs, but it's like never communicated through the public. And I felt like it was such a shame. And I felt like visual was such a really strong way to do it. Cause when I was learning biology, I love the illustrative diagrams. I'm always drawing when I'm learning science. And that was when I started thinking more seriously of pursuing and trying to combine science and art. And that was when I applied to graduate school for science illustration and started my journey of kind of honing my skills in illustrating science and eventually went into a more journalism um, field of doing infographic design, like combining storytelling, adding another layer of information in my visuals. Um, and yeah, I really love it. Like now I can explain science to my mom and like to people with art and still like be very in touch with the academic field since I still work with a lot of scientists. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome to hear. Yeah, I definitely know what you mean because I'm also a very um, visual person. So that's really cool. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you so much. So are there any um, more questions I see that call us? Do you have a question if you want to unmute yourself? Yeah. Hi. Thank you for so, so this vivid presentation. A lot of illustrations and pretty nice. So I'm wondering for sure that you need a lot of um, imagination to do this. And how do you spark this crea creative on you when you feel stuck? If you feel stuck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. And I kind of talked a little about how. Uh, amazing that a lot of times half of these crazy ideas do come with, from the scientists that I work with because they like are so um, more close to the content and know about it that they know so many different ways to describe it. So a lot of these visual ideas and metaphors spark from them and I kind of build up from it, such as like this cover image when he was talking about using water wheels and stuff. I was like, oh yeah, and then we can include like different juicers and items. And then other um, actually ideas that I have with like visual metaphors when I touch on a very hard science is really discussing with my friends and family that are very new to the context, like asking them like, oh, like, for example, recently I'm trying to describe like um, atmospheric science and quantum science, <laughs> like climate change, and it was just so complex. And then I was talking about like atmospheric windows and how gases release and then my friends was like, oh, like, can we actually draw a physical window and how the gases interact? Like, 
these little metaphors a lot of times help when I'm trying to explain to people that are totally new and they would be like, oh, that's kind of like pushing a fridge or、um, I don't know, like putting a plastic bag over something like these. Like, <laughs> I'm just randomly thinking out loud. Like, these ways are really helpful. And other ways also is I'm, I'm constantly looking at other really great, talented people of how they. Tell stories like I constantly look at the Washington Post, my colleagues at National Geographic, New York Times, the pudding. If you guys haven't looked, they're <laughs> full of fun ideas with visual metaphors. And all the times when I see someone else's idea, even though it has nothing to do with the topic that I report on, it will really spark new creations. And then I like put, I actually do a lot of screenshots of these random ideas or photos that I just like encounter. And have this whole bank called visual inspiration. So when I get stuck, I go back to that bank and look at things, and that really just like gets my light bulb on sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. It seems that it's like looking to the simple things and making notes of that in order for you not to forget. Yeah, definitely. It definitely helps to like collect it daily, and、um, it's a good exercise too. Yeah, to yeah, get yeah. the creative juice flowing. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thanks for asking. Thank you, thank you, Kala. So I think、uh, Samir has a question as well. Do you want to unmute yourself now? Yeah, ex- excellent. I mean, the the illustrations are incredible.、Uh, how how do you feel like, your role fits in with with the rise of software and technology? Like. I think like gold standard, you know, for a lot of scientists in the field is to rely on bio render. But I'll be honest, my creativity and my my artist brain is really limited. Where where do you feel like the role of a professional uh, 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 science design and artist like yourself、um, seems to be with with the software? Yeah.、Um... I did know BioRender. I think they're actually pretty good. Like I have nothing against people using BioRender. Honestly, it's interesting. A lot of people that are great graphic journalists or people that work on my team and at National Geographic don't actually know how to draw. Like, <laughs> like you'll be surprised. Like they just have really good understanding of good storytelling and information design and structure. So. I actually want to go back to this slide, and again, highly recommend these two books, especially Building Science Graphics. It's written by、um, my mentor Jen Christensen, and has like step-to-step guide, like workflows of how to improve your graphics and your like graphic abstract or poster presentation, etc. So. Even if you're not an illustrator or can't render really fully rendered illustrations, sometimes it's really of your purpose. You may not need it for your paper publication or presentation, but what is needed is actually the information design and structure. So, I encourage like learning kind of success of conveying your information through design and structure while using assets such as from bio render or working with other artists or. Trying it yourself, I'm okay. I'm constantly amazed how good scientists are in drawing in PowerPoints. Like it's incredible. I would not be able to do it at all. So using these tools that you're comfortable with can help you still achieve really good visual storytelling. And then the next level is to understand when to collaborate. Like we don't really need to know all the skills ourselves or to learn it. There's reasons why we have different skill sets to so to know when to collaborate with a professional science illustrator to really help bring your research to the next level. I think it's worth really worth the investment because it really helps you, like, create a lot of assets to use in the future. And also by working with a scientist myself and illustrator, I felt like talking through it with them also helps them break down their science because they have to. Explain it to me as a really dumb person first, not knowing it.、Um, so all these ways can really help still、um, build and improve your visual graphics、um, and your research without being an artist yourself. Does, does that answer your question? I'm not sure if that's like in line with your question. No, that's brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Daisy. So I think、um, because you have to leave in like three、right. minutes, so. Unless there's a super quick question, we'll probably、um, end the session here. So, 
thank you so much it was honestly so amazing and very very um exciting and interesting so yeah, that was one of the you. coolest talks i've seen in a while so <laughs> thank oh, you so thanks. i'm gonna pass this on to sarah now sarah if you want to um thank you Joni. thank you daisy it was a really lovely talk um now we're going for a 